Lee is a po- science and politics writer. Um, he writes widely, Nature, Scientific American, Guardian, Jacobin. Uh, and I first came to know him through Austerity Ecology and Collapse Porn Addicts, a, def- a Left Defense of Growth, Industry, Progress, and Stuff, which, very, yes, which very much um, reflects my own sentiments uh, as a former editor of a, an, a publication called Eco-Socialist Review, been uh, engaged with these issues for a long time and like the way that Lee, it comes at them. And even more excited by the book that uh, you more recently published, The People's Republic of Walmart, which addresses mm. the, the socialist calculation debate. And um, so you're a perfect person to um, address these topics of the future of work and how it relates to the topic of climate change and the degrowth debate about whether we need to slow down economic growth in order to address these issues. So I'll turn it over to you, Lee. All right. Um, so uh, I think the way this is this is going to work is I'm just going to give a, a little bit of a maybe 10 minute talk about um, my critique of degrowth. I guess I'll just define what degrowth is very quickly first, and then maybe we can get into some questions around how this relates to work and some of the proposals from uh, degrowthers or degrowthers around um, uh, the integration of universal basic income or UBI, um, a greater expansion of like care work instead of industrial and extractive um, industries um, and, um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, all right, I mean, I suppose, um, I mean, I, I'm not here to uh, offer a brief for ID growth, but to to critique it. So, uh, but very briefly, I mean, the argument that they would uh, that ID growthers would be making uh, is that um, economic growth um, is, however defined, is uh, the ultimate cause of um, ecological problems such as cl- primarily climate change, but also biodiversity loss. But there are other issues as well from nitrogen pollution to you know, historically the ozone layer, um, lead pollution, there's a um, plastic pollution. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's basically the, uh, the argument is that we need to um, uh, bring uh, economic growth to a halt, that we have enough um, uh, that, um, and it depends on who you're talking about, uh, talking to, but in general, the idea is that uh, the developing world uh, still needs to uh, to develop, um, and so there needs to be some sort of level of contraction in the global north, and, uh, the the sort of richer countries in the in the west. Um, uh, other people will say just um, that everybody needs to um, uh, retreat, and the, and there are. Some who incorporate a critique, many incorporate a critique of, of what they call consumerism, um, that particularly in the West, uh, in the global North, that we all, including the working class, we all consume too much. We overconsume, and we need to cut uh, cut that back, or in fact bring an end to consumerism and just focus on the needs uh, of, of of people. Um, any other sort of aspects I'm missing? I suppose it's not true of all of them. Some of them will say um, that uh, population is part of the issue, that it is not just about economic growth, but population growth. Other ones sort of wash their hands of that because of so, uh, so many historic associations between the overpopulation um, uh, advoc- or theorists, uh, campaigners around overpopulation and eugenics, um, sort of uh, anti-immigration politics, um, even racism. Uh, so there are other, so there are some that brush their hands with that. Um, other ones say, no, 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 we have to talk about both things. We have to talk about um, both economic growth and population growth that they go in, uh, go in hand. All right. I mean, I hope I've been uh, a steel man, not straw man, my opponent. That, that's, there's a lot more detail, um, but that's sort of the, 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 the core of the argument. Um, so my primary critique is that, you know, first of all, the, uh, I would say the growth, whether whether we're talking about econ- economic growth or population growth, is simply not the cause of climate change or other environmental challenges. Um, we have had many other environmental challenges in the past that we have um, actually solved. Um, 
uh, or largely overcome, even if there's some remaining issues, um, such as you know the hole in the ozone layer. In the 1980s, this was one of the this is one of the, the, the biggest environmental issues uh, facing humanity. If anything, um, the hole in the ozone layer. Um, the depletion of the ozone layer uh, was uh, it was a much more existential threat than, than even climate change, at least on a very shorter uh, time period, because um, a radical deterioration of the ozone layer would result in um, a, a great difficulty of for uh, macroscopic life on land and in like you know the top layers of oceans uh, to, to to continue to exist. Uh, so even the worst um, pro um, so projections for climate change. Uh, don't suggest anything close to that level of, of existential threat. But that, that issue is largely solved. Um, uh, acid rain, that acid rain in the 1980s was a, was, a, was a big issue, big environmental issue. And in much, much of the West, particularly around the Great Lakes area in North America. Um, and, um, and that again, that issue is, is largely solved, at least in the West. Um, lead pollution, um, uh, we still have lead in the environment as a result of our primarily as use of our uh, use of, 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 of lead in, 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 in gasoline. Um, but we have solved the issue in terms of it's, it's not in, in gasoline anymore. Um, and a great deal of air and water pollution um, uh, issues, again, in the, the global north, these issues have not completely been solved, but, uh, but, um, um, but largely been solved. And the solution to all of these, what solved all of these, these problems, and the, uh, the, the, sort of the classic example of the ozone layer um, uh, problem, was not bringing a, a halt to economic growth or population growth, uh, but instead from new technologies, from technology switching, and, and, and crucially, forms of economic planning in the form of regulation uh, technology and technology policy um, that allowed us to switch away from the technologies that uh, we had discovered were, um, uh, were causing the, uh, the ecological problem. Um, so in, yeah, in the case, so we, you know, we, uh, we didn't solve the problem of uh, um, the ozone layer by halting growth in fridges or cans of hairspray um, or any of the other uh, the uses of, of chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs, um, but by regulating the transition away from CFCs. And today we have uh, more fridges and cans of hairspray than there ever was in the 1980s. Um, as a science journalist, I would also say that um, degrowth fundamentally misdiagnoses the cause of climate change, uh, biodiversity loss and other environmental problems. And as a result of, of this, it has a poor theory of change. So there's a political issue there as well. In terms of, uh, when I say theory of change, I mean, uh, basically a strategy of how the problem can be solved. So um, in a recent article that I wrote for uh, the New Statesman in the UK, um, I, I used a, a sort of a thought experiment to explore this idea. Um, imagine if we had a fully socialist, or I should say that, um, that many um, degrowthers consider themselves to be socialists, not all of them, some of them are, 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 are certainly, uh, you know, pro-capitalism, but um, uh, a lot of them, particularly today, uh, do consider themselves to be socialists, some description or other. Um, I want to imagine a, like, let's imagine the 20th century was actually fully socialist, the whole world. Uh, imagine in, uh, in 1918, uh, the German revolution was successful instead of going down to defeat. And so instead of um, socialism being this, uh, this, this undemocratic barbarism that existed in the Soviet Union, we have democratic socialism um, in the industrial heart of, uh, of, of Europe, not in the backward, uh, primarily feudal country. Uh, it's, a, it's an industrial heart of Europe, which is <clears throat> where you know, Marx and Engels thought that um, the revolution would, 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 uh, would take place. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, this, sorry, I'm this, on something. I had to close up. It's, it's starting to rain, and <laughs> um, anyway, so let, let's just imagine an thought experiment. Let's like ma like make socialism maximally like awesome. Um, it spreads all throughout the world uh, very quickly as a result of its democratic nature, um, um, and. Um, as a result of this, one, one imagines that um, rather than um, electricity uh, industry being restricted to uh, just uh, the West, but it is, but electricity, you know, in, in the, the, the benefits of industrial development are delivered to the whole world. Um, 
uh, industrialization, yeah, it, it spreads everywhere. Um, not restricted to the West. Now, prior to the discovery of the full extent of the problem of global warming in the 1980s, this means that this, the, all these socialist, industrial socialist societies around the world um, uh, will be mainly using fossil fuels to power their industry, to heat their homes, um, for, for transport. Maybe you know, a lot of the transport will be uh, possibly much more sort of, um, uh, collectively oriented rather than uh, personally or privately oriented, but so, you know, we didn't really know what the, uh, the, the issue was until the 1980s. The, the phenomenon of, glo of global warming was certainly discovered in the late 19th century, but nobody really until the 1980s uh, fully understood the, um, uh, the, the, the scale of the threat. Um, uh, a lot, some of uh, the, the, the electri electricity will have come from hydroelectric hydroelectricity, which of course uh, has very, um, in most places has a very, uh, very low carbon intensity, but of course that's geographically restricted, so you can't use that everywhere. So a lot of places will still be using coal and natural gas and, and, and petroleum. Um, and of course, uh, it's not just the capitalists that want things to run 24 seven, but socialists also want their public hospitals to, uh, to be able to run 24 seven. And indeed, many of our factories um, and, and other services essential for social well-being also, uh, some of them need to be running 24-7. So we don't want to wait for the sun to shine and the wind to blow um, to turn on the ventilators and the dialysis machines um, in, our, in, our, in our public hospitals. So if anything, socialism would have resulted by the 1980s when we discovered the full extent of, 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 climate, of, of the threat of climate change, um, we, we probably, that industrialization and the, the fossil fuels that powered most of it would likely resulted, if anything, in much greater climate change than the actually existing capitalist um, and Stalinist uh, 20th century. Um, indeed, the vast majority of, in the real world, um, the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions entered the atmosphere, not since the Industrial Revolution, but since the 1950s. Um, what geosphere biosphere scientists uh, call the great acceleration. Um, this is, of course, 1950s. Any progressive will tell you that this is coincident with um, the advent of the welfare state and the legalization inst and institutionalization of free trade unions, um, the, the, the expansion of the working class into the middle class across um, uh, the, the, much of the West. Um, one could even be a bit cheeky and say that the that post-war social democracy caused climate change. Um, so is there even a benefit to socialism, uh, to progressivism at all with respect to climate change and other environmental issues? But let's uh, stick with climate change as the, as the model here. Absolutely. Upon the discovery of, of the problem, socialism or social democracy, even, even liberalism, um, can in principle act much faster than markets or market fundamentals and neoliberalism. And the reason for this is basically fourfold. First, and this relates back to my, um, my second book, The People's Republic of Walmart, the discussion of the importance of economic planning. First, any market actor that produces a commodity that is profitable, but harmful to ecosystem services, such as coal, oil, or gas, <clears throat> um, the, that market actor has an incentive to continue to produce, uh, continue production. This in turn spurs attempts by such companies to engage in a, uh, attempts at capture of uh, democratic decision-making, um, lobbying, bribes, corruption even, and as we've seen in the case of Volkswagen in, in, in Germany, um, outright criminal activity. Um, a publicly owned entity, so long as it is properly insulated for market activity, meanwhile, can in principle just carry out what the electorate demands. That is to say, if we discovered that um, the coal, gas, oil um, are, um, uh, are harming the climate, if a majority of people in society votes that we, we should stop that, then we simply direct those companies to um, to halt uh, that production, so long as there is an, an alternative, so long as there's a technological alternative for those socially necessary, for the socially necessary um, products that they produce. Second, there may be a range of goods and services that are not profitable, but are beneficial 
to maintenance and optimization of ecosystem services. And market actors <clears throat> have no incentive to produce those if they're not profitable. An example here with <clears throat> examples here might be um, clean energy infrastructure that has high upfront capital costs, such as conventional nuclear, large scale nuclear power, <clears throat> high speed rail lines, or the substantial research development and develop and deployment costs of carbon neutral um, uh, synthetic fuels for hard to electrify long haul shipping and long haul aviation. Again, a public actor is not restricted by the need for profitability, but instead only by economic capacity and technological development. And this relates to the third problem um, uh, with respect to markets and climate change or any other environmental issue. We may have straightforward technological solutions to decarbonize many sectors already, for example, nuclear power and renewables for electricity. But there are a whole host of sectors so there's, that are socially beneficial, but where it is just really hard to decarbonize, or even in a few cases, we simply don't know what, what to do about uh, this issue. And a really great example here is cement. Um, uh, there are some um, lab bench concepts, a couple of startups uh, that claim to be producing uh, carbon neutral, even carbon negative cement, uh, but um these are these are far from proven certainly far from proven at commercial scale um and for these sectors we will need strong state-led innovation policy and industrial policy um to de-risk to de-risk uh taking these potential potential technologies from lab bench or pilot project or startup um through to commercialization and even for those sectors where we do have straightforward solutions, in many cases, uh, the clean alternative is currently still far too expensive compared to the dirty um, uh, conventional um, technology. And so even here, and this is especially true for, for developing countries, something might be cheap uh, for us in the, in the global north, but it's still far too um, unaffordable for, uh, for developing countries. Um, and so even here, there's still a great need for industrial policy and innovation policy to shepherd radical cost reductions in those technologies. Such policies are, another, are, are of course, another form of economic planning rather than leaving these questions to the market. And we can see the, um, how, um, how difficult uh, this is with uh, so, uh, neoliberalism as, as uh, business as usual in the fact that the, the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States is it certainly doesn't go anywhere near as far as I would like to see with respect to industrial policy and economic planning and the fact that most of the um, uh, the, 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 the efforts will, uh, in terms of decarbonization, will pass through forms of tax credits to spur technological uh, switching or to support innovation, to de-risk innovation, de-risk commercialization, um, rather than simply public ownership, um, as in the case of the the, the, the the original New Deal in the 1930s, in the examples such as the, the Tennessee Valley Authority, that those would be the real models I would propose. But nevertheless, it is still a, a, a major break with um, the, the the classical neoliberal approach to uh, to dealing with climate change of the of the 2000s and, and, and 2010s of of of, more, of carbon pricing, either through emissions trading or or, or, or carbon taxes, and that, then let the market um, uh, solve solve the problem after. Um, uh, carbon has been appropriately priced. This is this is an active state intervention and and picking winners. This is this is very much uh, in opposition to um, classical uh, sort of neoliberal policy uh, preferences. And in and in the European Union, which is still very much caught in the grip of market fundamentalism, um, particularly within the European Commission, um, the EU is 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 denouncing the the Inflation Reduction Act because they describe this as a series of subsidies, that they are picking winners, uh, that they are um, uh, distorting markets, uh, that they are um, undermining, um, as a result of this, they're undermining European competitive, uh, the, the, the competitiveness of European industries. And I would say that a, a simple solution is that Europe should come up with its own um, Inflation Reduction Act, its own sort of um, industrial policies to support uh, clean innovation, even potentially maybe a, uh, some sort of a, a treaty between the United States and, and Europe um, to, uh, to commonly support uh, development of the, the, the necessary uh, clean technologies um, to, uh, to get to net zero by mid-century. Um, finally, 
<clears throat> while some environmental problems are restricted to one or, uh, one or a few sectors, <clears throat> thus the technology switching does not involve much coordination across different sectors. And an example of this uh, would be um, the, the chlorofluorocarbon, the uh, issue with the, with the ozone layer. It really is just a handful of sectors that we're, we're affected, so it's relatively straightforward to regulate them. With the issue of climate change and, greenh and greenhouse gases, this affects pretty much every um, industry, every sector, um, in, 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 in the modern world. Um, electricity, all of industry, transport, um, agriculture, there's very few that aren't affected by this. So there's also, um, uh, so the technology uh, switching also requires uh, coordination across multiple sectors. Um, <clears throat> in the case, sorry, fossil fuels are the foundation, as I say, the fossil fuels are the foundation of almost every sector, and they have met great many intertwined, uh, intertwined dependencies. Um, and this is uh, uh, called uh, a, a, a coordination problem. And markets are very, very bad at, at solving coordination problems. Um, for example, we need to sunset the petroleum and uh, uh, petroleum production uh, for combustion purposes, at least sometime in the next 20 to 30 years, uh, if we're going to reach net zero emissions by mid-century. <clears throat> Um, but we also uh, need to um, uh, maintain uh, petroleum production for not, uh, for non-combustion purposes, uh, petrochemical purposes. And of course, if we um, halted all production, uh, petroleum production tomorrow, society would collapse. And the um, many of the 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 the, 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 um, the harms that are projected as a result of climate change would would suddenly ha would immediately happen. Um, <clears throat> So we need to be able to coordinate sufficient production of petroleum to maintain society, even as we carefully wind down production overall for combustion and maintaining sufficient production for petrochemicals. All of this, so you're, you're trying to sunset an industry while maintaining it sufficient to keep society going. All of this runs counter to how market actors um, operate, have to operate. And so at a minimum, the state needs to step in and to supervise this coordination. And at a maximum, and at a maximum, the state may need to directly take over uh, these sectors, particularly uh, towards the end of their, um, um, uh, their lifetimes. So we, we don't just have this sudden collapse in, in, in production. Um, indeed, during the, um, the, the pandemic, um, because of the, uh, uh, so for, for many months there, there was a real drop off in, in, in transport, in trade, um, in travel. Um, and uh, so a lot of petroleum uh, production was, was, shut, was temporarily shuttered and then ultimately mothballed, um, particularly with respect to oil refiners because a lot of petroleum companies saw the writing on the wall and, and uh, that in the, in the future, we, uh, we, we need to, uh, regulation will be um, sunsetting this industry. And so there was a real reluctance on the part of them to, to increase um, um, uh, um, oil refinery um, capacity. Uh, so we had this very strange situation where we needed to increase oil refinery uh, capacity at the same time overall still having a vision of, 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 shutting, uh, of, of shutting that industry down. Um, um, the market actors were just there's 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 a great sort of confusion there about what what uh, uh, what should be done, um, or not a great confusion. Uh, that they, they just it, that's not how they act. That's not how market actors uh, act. Um, and I, finally, I would say that I also oppose degrowth because it demands, and this is much broader with, than just with respect to climate change, but I would also argue against that socialist progressives, liberals should oppose degrowth because it demands a stagnation or even a reduction of the incomes of, of, of uh, the Western working class. Degrowthers, uh, uh, let's remember, assert that workers in the global North consume too much. Of course, the reality is that um, uh, most Western workers have, in fact, suffered through perhaps uh, more than four decades of austerity, of real wage stagnation in many sectors, um, or even decline in some sectors, deindustrialization, and gro growing e inequality and precarity. Um, so when so many Western workers are living from paycheck to paycheck, you really have to come from a sort of wealthy background to not notice this and think that all Western workers consume too much. 
Um, I remember when I was at, at a university and the sort of, the, the sort of eco anarchists were on uh, around American Thanksgiving and uh, uh, Black Friday, they would hand out these these leaflets encouraging us to uh, to buy nothing on that day. In fact, and it was called Buy Nothing Day. This was also promoted by Adbusters. Uh, Naomi, Klein, Naomi Klein was a big uh, supporter of this concept as well. And it sort of tells you how old I am. <laughs> um, um, if I was reading Adbusters. Um, and, but, but at that time, uh, my family was going through uh, some real um, economic hardship. Um, I was maxed out in my student loans and I had almost no money. Many, many times I, had, I, I actually had no money. And, um, I wanted some finally able to buy more days uh, rather than buy nothing days. Uh, there's a real sort of class dynamic here with respect here. Let me just, being blinded by the sun. Um, there's a real class class dynamic here that it takes, as I say, it takes a certain uh, level of privilege to be able to think that most Western workers um, uh, consume too much. Um, there's a sort of practical aspect to this as well, or rather there's an incoherence. Uh, when any workers go on strike, um, uh, socialists, progressives, um, hopefully most liberals, um, actually want the workers to win higher wages. Of course, there are other issues in terms of uh, other demands the workers might have on um, when going on strike, but very often it is for an increase in, in, in wages. But degrowthers assert, remember, that their incomes are too high already. That, we consume, that they consume too much. So it follows logically that an even higher income would be even more environmentally destructive. So objectively, they, uh, the degrowthers are siding with the bosses. Now, the reality is that they probably don't. Most, most um, degrowthers consider themselves to be progressive, even socialist. And so they probably will join that picket line or support that picket line, support the workers. But then there's an incoherent, there's a fundamental log logical incoherence there. You cannot say that Western workers consume too much and demand that they uh, their, uh, their, uh, uh, support the demands for higher wages. Um, one of the world's leading experts on inequality, Franco Milanovic, uh, or Milanovic, um, uh, has done a rough calculation, sort of back of the envelope calculation, on what a radical distribution of income, meaning everyone in the world um, earning the same income, um, what it would mean. Uh, so we're thinking here about uh, the, 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 uh, the demand of degrowthers that the uh, developed world will increase their, their incomes and um, the um, people in the, uh, everybody, including the Western workers in, in the West, in the global North will decrease uh, their incomes. Um, if everybody, if, if uh, uh, income was, excuse me, perfectly equally uh, redistributed, um, every person would earn, this is a back of the envelope calculation, but it, so it's not, a, it's not a number that you want to hold fast to, but rather instead it gives you a sense of what we're talking about here. Each person would earn just $5,500 US per year. While this would be a big increase in the standard of living for many in the global south, this would obviously amount to a sharp reduction in the standard of living for almost all workers in the global north. There simply isn't enough wealth in the world yet for everyone to earn a decent income. Um, let's imagine what, you know, what would be a really a wonderful world uh, where every, what, everybody, every one of the 8 billion people in the, on the planet earns, say, an income of a nice middle-class Norwegian. We don't, we simply don't have enough um, uh, wealth in the world. There hasn't been enough economic growth yet for that to happen. <clears throat> Lastly, um, degrowthers assert that, uh, I've said finally a few times now, that, so this really is coming to the end, um, degrowthers assert that we already have enough, uh, but um, all of scientific investigation, medical discoveries, and technological innovation assume a lack. They assume that we do not have enough. So let's assume that uh, degrowthers desired economy is indeed implemented. There is no more economic growth. If a scientist in that society, a medical researcher or an engineer discovers or invents something new, that would count as economic growth for it is an addition to what there already is. 
Now, to be fair, most degrowthers do not argue for an end to new science, new medicine and technology, although there are some who do. Um, but this is the logical consequence of their argument that they perhaps the many of them perhaps don't realize. Um, of course, as I say, there are indeed a, a handful of degrowthers who do recognize this is the logical consequence and are fine with it. And they, and they argue that um, progress in fact is a myth um, or even have some sort of soft Luddite or anti-technology views. It's a shame that Paris Marx didn't turn up because we could have talked about his Luddism there. Um, and let's remember that the left broadly construed from Marxism and anarchism through to, to liberalism has been battling Malthusianism for, Malthusianism for over a century. We can go back to Friedrich Engels' critique of Malthus in the 19th century uh, for not understanding the role of science and innovation. Marx saw the, mar the marvels of capitalism and the industrial revolution and wondered how much farther humanity could go if production were not restricted to the profit incentive. We could have so much more than capitalism can produce. And this, of course, is what he ca called uh, the unfettering of the forces of production. And today we can see what he meant uh, concretely uh, in many sectors, not least in pharmaceuticals. About four decades ago, large pharmaceutical, pharmaceuticals, uh, pharmaceutical companies largely got out of the business of research and development of new classes of antibiotics. And this is because antibiotics are insufficiently profitable compared to drugs for chronic conditions that have to be taken every day for the rest of someone's life. Uh, whereas antibiotics, if you've taken a course of antibiotics, you take them for a few days, maybe a few weeks. In the case of tuberculosis, uh, your course of antibiotics is maybe a few months. But after that, if the antibiotics are working, you're not taking them again. Um, and so here is a great example of how socialism um, or, or so even social democracy uh, would produce so much more. We wouldn't need to make a profit in order to research and develop uh, new antibiotics. We would just do this. Um, but, 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 um, I suppose I, I should talk uh, just a little bit about um, no, I think that's probably good. Maybe in the questions we can talk about decoupling, absolute and relative decoupling, and um, the world of work, and how all this relates to um, questions of extractivism and care work and uh, universal basic, basic income and stuff like that. Was that good as a as an as an intro to the uh, to the socialist critique of or progressive critique of degrowth? Very nice. Um, I'll start off um, with a general ideological question, which is that Prometheanism used to be the kind of default um, of the left of left thought. How do you describe or understand why um, a more pastoralist or Luddite uh, approach to these things became dominant? And do you see a return uh, to an interest in a kind of more Promethean perspective? This is a really, really great question. I think it, come, it actually gets to the heart of the matter because it's not enough just to have a critique of, of this, but to explain why this has happened and why this, uh, this ideology uh, more broadly considered, because it's not just about degrowth. I mean, there's Luddism. I mean, what I call eco-austerity. There's many other aspects to this as well. So, you know, fear of genetic engineering, GMOs, uh, anti-nuclearism, um, uh, the, the opposition to uh, carbon capture and storage and um, uh, geoengineering, um, the, the whole uh, sort of organic agriculture um, uh, fad and its fear of, uh, its chemophobia, fear of chemistry. Um, it, there's so many aspects uh, that, uh, that go beyond just, just climate change. Here, hold on a sec, let me have a slurp of coffee. Um, I guess the first thing I would say is, yeah, it, it is bizarre. It is very bizarre to see that um, how so much of the left has been kept captured by this eco-austerity um, uh, uh, um, ideology, including degrowth. Um, Hal Draper, the great um, uh, democratic socialist, uh, American de democratic socialist in the middle mid 20th century, um, he talks about <clears throat> what would you define uh, in terms of his definition of, of socialism very, very simply. The definition of self, human self-emancipation, he says it's a simple arithmetic of 
Prometheus plus Spartacus. What he means by this is that if you if you only have Spartacus, the sort of the demand for radical equality for uh, for for freedom for liberation, um, um, uh, without Prometheus, without technology, technological advanced innovation, medicine, agricultural innovation, um, you simply have a, an equality of poverty. Um, but we can go back again to to Marx to um, to um, uh, Sylvia Pankhurst. The great suffragette and, and socialist. And she wrote in the, I think it was the first issue of the Workers' Dreadnought uh, newspaper um, that um, uh, we want, socialism does not want, uh, want an equality of, of, of penury, but of abundance. Um, uh, we want have every peasant a lord, not every lord a peasant. Conversely, if you only have um, Prometheus without Spartacus, you limit the, uh, the potential liberation that you can have because you are restricting uh, technological innovation to the wealthy, to the, to the, to the elites, the, uh, to the, the bourgeoisie or the, um, 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 uh, the aristocracy. Um, and as a result of that, um, all these other wonderful human beings, these universal problem solvers that could create more innovation, could uh, discover new medicines, um, of benefit to um, uh, to the bourgeoisie, to the aristocracy, um, are, are 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 imprisoned. They aren't uh, allowed to. Uh, they're imprisoned in drudgery and servitude, and they aren't allowed to uh, to, to reach their full potential, the full intellectual potential. Whether also with respect to art or music or architecture, it doesn't have to be um, um, uh, medicine or, um, or or technology or science. Um, all these things enrich our lives. Um, uh, therefore. The lives of, 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 of class elites are diminished, their freedom is restricted, their degrees of freedom are restricted as a result of the, the lack of coupling of Prometheus to, to Spartacus. You have to have Prometheus and Spartacus together. Um, um, uh, you, you, you just reading the, uh, the Communist Manifesto, you can see this, uh, that you know, Marx has this, uh, it's, it's probably the greatest um, sort of paean to, uh, to, to, to industrial capitalism that has ever been written, far surpassing any sort of hosannas that you might get from, uh, from, from uh, uh, Peter Thiel or Elon Musk. Um, but he, 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 he wondered what, what we could unleash if we were not restricted to only producing for profit. Um, so it's not just Marx, it's not just Engels, um, Pankers, uh, Lenin described, uh, defined uh, communism as, as, as um, uh, um, workers count Soviets plus the electrification of the entire country. Um, uh, you can go to the, the mid 1960s and, and Harold Wilson, the Labour uh, Prime Minister of, of the UK, and, and his famous uh, white heat of technology speech and the importance of of, 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 of technology as a, as a source of liberation for, for the working class. Um, uh, Tony Benn, uh, who died a few years ago and was the great, you know, one of the great heroes of, of, of British socialism. He was sort of like the British Bernie Sanders, if any more radical than, than Bernie Sanders. But he was, uh, he was a minister of technology in, 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 I think it was the Wilson government. And he was the, the, the primary architect or policy architect of the Concord. Uh, Concord airplane, and we have to remember that um, while there were a series of crashes that uh, ultimately that finally killed off um, uh, the Concord, what really killed off Concord was neoliberalism. That Margaret Thatcher felt that um, uh, this was a this was again this was a government picking winner picking technology winners. It was not the role of the government to be uh, to be doing that, and she um, before uh, the Concord had managed to make the transition. Uh, from primarily servicing the wealthy to um, uh, to uh, 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 mass consumers that could uh, properly fund it in the marketplace rather than without um, uh, government funding. When she pulled the when she yanked the, the plug on that, that basically is what um, what defeated um, uh, supersonic um, air travel. And so bizarrely. Um, we can see that um, uh, there was a, a great a democratic socialist in the, in, in, in the man of, uh, in the form of Tony Benn, who had this vision of supersonic air travel, and it was capitalism, it was neoliberalism that uh, that, that held us back from technological advance. Uh, it is bizarre 
that in the in the the, the, the third uh, uh, decade of the 21st century, we don't have super uh, 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 public um, uh, public accessible uh, supersonic travel anymore. It's gone. That technology is we've retreated from that technology. Um, yeah, I, I, so in terms of why did this happen? So I would argue that, and there was a crucial development in the in the 1970s um, when we have the advent of neoliberalism, the sort of neoliberal neoliberal revolution of Thatcher and Reagan and um, other figures in, in in the Western world, uh, the, uh, the the breaking of the the power of the trade unions and the, the class as a whole uh, through you know the Volcker shock in the United States, um, um, the Pre, prior to that, there was a, when one talked about the left and one talked about the working class and trade unions, one often, they weren't necessarily exactly the same thing, but they were as close as synonyms, as close to synonym to synonyms, as you can imagine, they're almost uh, synonyms. Um, uh, today, when we talk about the left and the working class, they are clearly two different things. What happened, I, I would argue, in the 1970s and 1980s, as a result of the uh, the conscious defeat of the working class by the Thatcherites and the Reaganites was that the the intellectuals within the working uh, within the working class movement uh, within the left retreated from the trade unions, retreated from the class to the academy, to the media, and to NGOs and to government. Um, now I hold up my hand here and say, like that's that's me. There's nothing wrong with those uh, the uh, being a, uh, an academic, being a journalist. Um, there might be some issues with the working in NGOs, but um, that's a whole other uh, question. <clears throat> um, but what we don't want is um, a, a left that is entirely made up of a particular uh, class of people, more middle class people. We, what we want is to be left to be fully representative of the entirety of the class. And as a result of this, uh, the separation of the class from the left, um, the, 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 uh, the, the, both the formal uh, learning and the tacit knowledge that the industrial working class, the industrial parts of the working class have about industrial systems, about extractive systems, about transportation systems, about agriculture, is no longer disciplining uh, the, the knowledge and the understanding of the intellectuals of the left. There's a, there's a, there's a, uh, uh, there's a, uh, an epistemic separation between the left and the class. So, in, uh, finally, to uh, to respond uh, to uh, so, that, so you know, some some degrowth fad can emerge in the academy, and no, and or anti-extractivism. That's another sort of um, concept that we can talk about. Anti-extractivism, uh, popularized by Naomi, Naomi Klein and figures such as the Rio Francos today. Um, um, are on the front lines of, of, of that sort of discourse, bringing, basically bringing an end to mining. Um, nobody in the class is able to tell those people, like, well, how will you do anything? You know, you're having these Zoom conversations about campaigning against extractivism. How will you have your computers if you don't dig stuff out of the mine, uh, out, of, out of the ground? <clears throat> um, Excellent. And any connection between these issues and Piketty, I'm always down for. So, you because you just you just address the division between the industrial working class and and the middle class. So, what one hundred percent? Thomas Piketty is uh, and his discussion of the, the the Brahmin left is another way to to conceive of this. Um, Catherine Liu and and Barbara Ehrenreich and other uh, Adolf Reed, their discussion around the professional managerial class is another way to conceive of this. I I accept uh, some of the critiques of uh, PMC or professional managerial class discourse in that it is it is under theorized. Are they professionals? Are they managers? Fair enough. Uh, the the point being that. Uh, we on the left used to have a, uh, a capacity for critique of bureaucracy, of bureaucratization, of why this happens. Um, um, uh, certainly within Trotskyism, uh, the, uh, the, the, the great uh, theorization of, one can have some uh, critiques certainly of the vociferousness of, of Trotskyism, Trotskyist group, but certainly theoretically uh, the development of a conception of why bureaucracy emerges um, within uh, or emerged within the Soviet Union, which was also then applicable to why bureaucracy emerges in the public sector in the, in the democratic West, why bureaucracy emerges in large corporations. Um, we should be able to turn that, that, that crucial insight, on, uh, turn that against ourselves and say, well, what, why has this happened? Did, in terms of, of late, what late. can be done about this, sorry. Oh, I do, we just have two questions. I, I don't wanna monopolize your time. Um, do you mind if we turn it's, to- 
go, go ahead and finish. Go ahead and finish. 30, 30 seconds, well, less than 30 seconds, I'll be done. How do we fix this? I, I'm a little bit um, uh, pessimistic about this because I don't think that um, uh, it, this question will be fu fundamentally resolved until the class, the industri particularly the industrial parts of the working class, and it's not the only part of the working class, there are other parts as well, but it is still a very, very important part of the class, until the class as a whole wakes up um, uh, uh, and acts for itself once again and begins to discipline the intellectuals within the, um, uh, within the working class. I see some hope there. I think there has been a little bit of an uptick in working class struggle in the United States, in the UK to a certain extent, that's optimistic, but still we're very, very, um, in terms of the, the rates of uh, days off due to strikes or whatever, uh, however you, you measure uh, industrial militancy, um, uh, we're still uh, very, still very, very low levels, even compared to the 1970s, 1980s. But that's um, that's the only path. The only path is the class waking up and acting for itself and disciplining uh, the intellectuals. David. Hi. Yes. Thanks, Lee. Um, I suppose what, what, what I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not a philosopher, and I tend to, but I, I do focus on climate change, and you know, the the, the complete dismissal of degrowth because we like technology because, or because extractivism because we have to get stuff out of mind so you know, it's a matter of scale pace timing cost and the politics of it as well mm -hmm. um you know i was influenced as a kid by the club of rome that early modeling and particularly that you know when you solve any one constraint you're all familiar with the club of rome all that modeling showing we hit a wall we overshoot we you know the the, the economy collapses um you relax any one constraint there oh we find a solution to you know electricity generation we find a solution to this to that you know it gives you another few years and then you hit the wall again and it was you know herman daly just a, who died a couple of weeks ago who you know, i mean just the fundamental insight you can't have infinite growth on a finite planet and yes technology slows that down but then you get into the realm of engineering and costs and resources not philosophy per se Right. And yes, you know, we are quite rapidly decarbonizing the power sector, but not fast enough. And we're not decarbonizing the uh, transportation far enough. Um, how far can we, you know, we are decoupling slowly energy from D GDP and carbon from energy. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, the fundamental equation of population times energy times carbon intensity, you know, that's emissions. You can't get away from it. And at 8 billion people and rising, you know, that's one, you, you can't take that out of the equation. Um, doesn't mean, you know, we all have to follow Malthus. Um, but when you, so, so I'm saying, you know, we have to look at the pace of decarbonization, the rate at which new technologies come in. But, you know, my own view is, you know, technology isn't necessarily the constraint here. Socialism solves some things. It's, it can solve the problem of externalities. If we have wise socialist leaders, yes, we can solve monopolies. Yes, we could solve externalities. It doesn't necessarily solve the problem of scarcity. It doesn't make nuclear power necessarily safer or cheaper. Um, and, you know, we still have to decide as a society, are we going to invest hundreds of billions in high speed rail to, re to replace short, you know, uh, to replace planes in the short run? Um, for shorter hops um but then you know get to the Why political would, when we look at the failure of of cop 27 and most of the cops before this the conference of the parties uh the last one in Sharm el sheikh um you know it's, we see it's a political problem as much as anything partly that's corporate lobbying you know function of capitalism clearly but partly it's also states acting as if it's as if they're companies so whether it's Saudi Arabia or whether it's the US and Australia, you know, large exporters of coal think of themselves as companies. And that's not just lobbying, it's sort of internalizing a worldview, but it's also democratic politics. You know, we, with the, the working class these days, you know, are, are, are concerned about the price of, of uh, gasoline at the pump and they're concerned about, you know, the price of food. Um, it, you know, it's not clear that democracies have that much more room. You know, I used to think it was more sort of the people versus the corporations, but it's not. You know, I mean, the rise of populism and certainly the way that ideologies have maybe somewhat, you know, cleverly been fused so that climate denial is part of populist politics, which is increasingly appealing to working class. Now, you can take all of that apart, of course, but, you know, it, it is a feature of, of, of democracies 
and that makes it hard for the even the wise politicians these days you know the people who are more able to act to the more authoritarian countries and even there they're concerned about their legitimacy see what's going on in china so what i'm saying is i suppose is that you know i i'm not so sure that socialism solves some of these things and that democracy does these are complex problems and we have to you know weigh up degrowth is super unpopular for sure um but at the same time you know with eight rise getting towards 10 billion people on the planet in a decade or two can everybody have a car and a fridge and a you know, even if they're twice as efficient as today, you know, that's an engineering problem. It's a, you know, a modeling problem, maybe. It's not just a philosoph philosoph philosophical problem, is what standard of living can the planet survive with technologies that are foreseeable and cost effective in the next 10, 20 years, which is the kind of timeline we have to solve this with carbon budgets. And anyway, I'll leave it there. Other people can speak as <laughs> Do you, do you want to respond or take another and then respond in, in total? You're, you're muted. There was a lot there to respond <laughs> to. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, sure. Let's have one more question. Dave, David Wood. So my question is back to how do we fix this? Because I share your analysis. I think green growth is the solution. I think states should be involved. The way you've explained it seems very sensible to me. There can be strong state-led innova in, in, in innovation, provided the politicians are receiving the right advice, provided the politicians aren't enthralled to the wrong industries. But where is this going to happen? And I take your criticism of the EU Commission, that they are ideologically wrong in their objections to some of the winning, picking of winners that uh, is in the US bill. So you said you weren't quite sure how this could be fixed. Well, is there some part of the world where there is more sensible politics? It may not be exactly the kind of socialism you've got in mind, but there may be some group of countries. I'm quite fond of what South Korea has done sometimes in the past. They were brilliant in some of their industrial policies over the years. Uh, is there hope for some other parts of the world, even China or uh, goodness knows where, or are we all equally bad at this, all countries of the world? China seems to be degrowthing itself all by itself. Um, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll do this in reverse order. Um, so I was pessimistic about what, to, what is to be done about uh, the phenomenon of eco austerity on the left, or conceptions of degrowth and the, degener the degeneracy of of, uh, of the left, um, I'm not actually pessimistic about what what is to be done about climate change. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic. Um, I think that um, a decade ago, everybody was uh, focused on uh, neoliberal solutions, primarily based around uh, carbon pricing. Uh, Europe, unfortunately, still is leaning uh, more, in, uh, it, it's still depending for primarily in that direction. Um, but the United States, that, that debate is over. There is no way that, the, um, uh, that any democratic uh, uh, administration, democratic Congress is gonna revisit um, uh, carbon pricing in any serious way is the primary mechanism of, of, of decarbonization. It is politically toxic. Um, uh, so it's just, it's not going to happen. And um, what is really quite exciting is the fact is, is how, uh, for, to my mind, even if the Inflation Act, Inflation Reduction Act is nowhere near as, as, as expansive as the Green New Deal as originally conceived, uh, in terms of the, the the raw numbers, in terms of the uh, uh, hundreds of billions instead of a couple trillion, um, that it is nowhere near as expensive in terms of uh, direct public ownership compared to, uh, as I said earlier, tax primarily using tax credits. It is, I think, a lot of the, the left that is critiquing it is really missing the wood for the trees. And like this is a radical break with neoliberalism as normal. What we need to be doing is leaning into that and pushing them to go further. Uh, to be um, recognizing the opportunity here, to be talking about economic planning, to be talking about innovation policy, uh, industrial policy, 
um, and, and, and direct public ownership, public, um, uh, public building of infrastructure. Um, what's, what's very interesting here is that even on the right, there is an opening within the Republican Party to be talking about that. Um, some of it comes down to the fact that um, uh, people like Marco Rubio, uh, you know, there was a report that he put out, I think about two, three years ago, about how the United States needs to engage in a lot more economic planning in order to be able to uh, to compete with with China. Um, I mean, I don't know if that's necessarily the right sort of, um, uh, sort of inter-imperial rivalries is necessarily the right uh, sort of um, uh, rationale for this, but certainly it, it is interesting that even on the, 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 the right, the hard right of the Republican Party, there is an opening to a break with neoliberalism um, as a, a business as usual. Um, and so I think the second thing I would say in terms of practical activity that we can be doing around this, um, I would say just, I wouldn't say forget the green left, but certainly I, I don't think we should be prioritizing the green NGOs and the activists, the activismists, um, but instead prioritizing um, the unions, particularly the industrial unions, um, the transport unions. Most of these have really great ideas about um, what needs to be done in terms of the correct policies, the policies that really will um, result in uh, rapid decarbonization. They depend on things like nuclear power. They recognize the role of uh, natural gas as a bridging fuel, they recognize the necessity of carbon capture and storage. They recognize that what can have that one needs um, hydraulic fracturing if we're going to be in, uh, engaging in uh, enhanced geothermal systems. And we only have three options for, for clean backup of uh, variable renewables like wind and solar. One is nuclear, one is hydroelectricity, and one is geothermal. Hydroelectricity obviously is radically uh, geographically limited. I'd love everything to be nuclear, but realistically that faces some, uh, some political political challenges. So often we um, um, uh, Greens will uh, rightly talk about geothermal as, as another source of a dispatchable clean electricity because it's available yeah, it's available 24 seven, unlike wind and solar and <clears throat> wave and tidal. But again, it's geographically uh, constrained. You have to, you're looking for, for, uh, for hot aquifers basically. And hence geothermal systems allows you to look for hot rocks anywhere. And if you go deep enough, there's hot rocks everywhere. But in order to be able to access uh, that, you need enhanced geothermal systems, which is hydraulic fracturing. Um, so um, the, the, um, whether you're talking about, whatever, it doesn't matter which, uh, which industrial union you're talking about, they recognize that this needs to be done. And they're beginning to get sick and tired of the, uh, the green left NGOs, often backed by um, uh, uh, billionaire uh, funded foundations uh, that, do, that are often um, antipathetic towards um, uh, trade unions or um, working class mobilization um, and are beginning to take over the tiller of this, of this ship of, of decarbonization, um, particularly in the United States. And I think that's all to be, uh, to be cheered on. Um, Sarah Nelson, the incredible militant uh, uh, president of the um, uh, Flight Attendants Union in the United States, probably one of the most militant uh, union leaders in the United States. There was an inter interesting interview with her a couple of years ago in, I think it was Labor Notes, might've been The Nation magazine. Anyway, one of these are very you know, venerable left-wing publications. And they were asking her about, you know, decarbonization and how we need to, and the interview was, you know, are we going to have to be able to, you know, you know uh, reduce or um, replace um, aviation? And she just laughs at them. She says, what are you talking about? What we need to be doing is we need sustainable air, um, uh, aviation fuels and uh, electric fuels in those places where um, um, uh, uh, biofuels are, are, aren't scalable. We need the uh, innovation policy to take those things from lab bench through to commercialization. We don't actually know which, uh, which is the, the optimum yet, whether we're talking about uh, synthetic hydrocarbons or hydrogen. I'm very skeptical about uh, pure molecular hydrogen. I, I think there's so many techn technological challenges about. Also, we need to be open to maybe there can be some uh, developments. I've gone back and forth maybe three, four times on biofuels over the past uh, 10 years in terms of my opinion about what, uh, what uh, their role in, uh, in the clean transition. Um, <clears throat> and um, she's very clear that what we need is industrial policy to, to take these from lab bench and pilot projects into commercialization, that that's what we need to be doing. Not talking about 
um, shuttering aviation. The reality is that most of the growth in aviation over the, the, the rest of the century is going to be coming from the developing world in any case, uh, the, particularly the emerging economies. And how dare we in the, in the West say that they can't have uh, what we have. Um, the idea that um, that uh, the, the, the language about um, aviation being this luxury. I mean, um, working class people save up to be able to go on holidays. There are, um, uh, and, and travel itself is a wonderful mind opening, um, uh, culturally expansive um, uh, technological uh, development, allowing us a greater sympathy for people all over the planet. Um, it's, it's universalism, it's, 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 uh, it's internationalism inherent in the technology. Um, how on earth are the, um, uh, the, the, the people of, of, of Hawaii or Puerto Rico um, or Guam um, historically colonially you know, uh, dislocated and continue to be uh, often dismissed um, uh, as part of uh, the, the centrality of American political discourse? How were they supposed to be able to participate in national democracy without, um, without aviation? There's not going to be a high-speed rail link between Hawaii and the mainland ever. Um, Although that would be a good job creator. Lee, let me turn it over to Nir for a yeah, second. Sorry, sorry, yeah, and Musk could dig a tunnel, yeah. <laughs> um, so I do want to get back to, I, I, I'm taking up too much time, but I do want to get to, back to some of the questions from uh, the other person whose name I've forgotten, um, about Herman Daly, infinite growth on a finite planet, you hit a wall, um, what else was there? Um, we're not going, fa even if we are decoupling, we're not decoupling fast enough, that sort of stuff. But do you want to get to, to that in a, a sec? Because those are all great questions, although I disagree with the sort of the thrust of it. Um, so, Lee, thank you, first of all. This is fascinating. And uh, so I'm convinced uh, about your argument that uh, we actually need growth to solve some of the uh, ecological uh, problems. I guess my question is, uh, is there a um, tension between the endorsement of growth uh, and uh, between some kind of commitment uh, to sustainability? Can you have uh, both of those? Uh, so in other words, um, if growth is uh, kosher or you know, even for instrumental uh, reasons, the instrumental reasons you describe, it's hard to see how it doesn't become uh, the only criterion for a uh, firm and for national success, uh, as it actually is, both for firms and for uh, nations. It becomes the sort of marker of whether a firm is doing well and whether a nation is doing well. Um, and uh, to the extent that we uh, accept that, we have a sort of inherent uh, challenge of sustainability uh, because growth is usually not sort of purpose-driven growth. So I'm wondering uh, if you see a contradiction there and um, how you suggest it can be managed. Sure, okay. So um, I think your first point is, is very sound. Um, hopefully most people, even the growthers, will recognize that we do need um, build out of all sorts of clean electricity generation the, the, the line is that we might need to electrify, clean up electricity and then electrify everything. Apart from those, those handful of sectors where we, we can't, they're hard to electrify, so we'll need some sort of synthetic fuels. But again, that generally requires, um, um, depends on a, a background of, of, of clean electricity or clean heat. <clears throat> so whatever we're, whatever we're talking about, we're talking about a massive, like new, uh, new Deal level build out of new infrastructure of electricity, clean electricity infrastructure. And of course, that's going to produce an enormous amount of economic growth. So it, it just it, that first point you make, I think, is a really, really an another great critique of the degrowthers is um, what we're talking about inevitably results in enormous economic growth. So if economic growth is the problem, how can it also be the solution? You know, the response to this to some of them is, like, oh, whoa, 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 well, this will be the last bit of economic growth and then we'll stop. Well, then I, I still think that that, that, um, that undermines the very premise that economic growth is, is, is the problem. Um, with respect to um, uh, economic growth as the, the, the main marker of success for a firm or for, for, for a company, uh, for a country, I mean, I, certainly any progressive should be quite comfortable with the critique of um, 
GDP as, as the, the, the metric that we use to, to, uh, to measure that uh, success. But there are many other ways that we, uh, many other metrics that we could use. A socialist society wouldn't be using uh, GDP as, as its metric of, uh, of how it's measuring the success of its society because there wouldn't be any markets anymore or they would be highly constrained, much more highly constrained at least. <laughs> And GDP is, 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 is inherently a market-based uh, sort of metric. So we, we, would have, we could have other metrics. So, but, but you're, you're committed to this idea that public sector growth, non-private sector growth can really deliver the technological solutions that, you, that you're concerned with? I mean, I would say that, if I put it another way, um, the, the human development requires constant growth in new value we want new we want new science new medicine new technology always there it, it's, it's boundless there isn't a point where we say this much and, and, and no further if we say okay we've got enough stuff what happens if uh, uh, in the next five to ten years we discover a way to eliminate completely dementia do we say we don't want that um that technology and then once we've done that, there will be other things. The, this, 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 the nature of the human is that we, there is not a sort of, our needs are constantly um, expanding. Um, if we want to talk about pure um, um, biological needs, well, the biological needs of every prisoner and every prison on the planet are met. That's not being a human. Um, uh, human human needs are are boundless. They're open ended. They, 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 we never cease to want more. We can absolutely uh, talk about how uh, we and Socia certainly would have a discussion about how the um, the choices within a market economy are driven primarily by what is profitable, and there may be a gap. There is a gap often between what is profitable and what society wants. And so we, we would almost certainly produ be producing a different set of things than, uh, than within capitalism. I mean, there's obviously be a lot of uh, cross uh, overlap as well, but we would be, the, the set of things that are profitable is much smaller than the set of things that are, uh, sorry, the set of things that are um, beneficial but not profitable is much larger than the set of things that are beneficial but, uh, but profitable. I guess what I'm trying to ask is, wouldn't the free market theorists argue that you only get the kind of growth that you want in order to solve the massive uh, uh, challenges that you've mentioned from free markets? On the contrary, I mean, even the most, uh, typically the most, um, even, the, even the most market um, 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 friendly advocates still recognize that um, the bulk of innovation, the bulk of um, basic research um, is done uh, by public universities or uh, government research agencies uh, because uh, the, the private sector just is too risk averse to do that. I mean, Marian, Mariana Mazzucato, the Italian American economist is very, very good on, on uh, th this, this question in terms of where innovation comes from. The vast, it's not to say that there's no innovation in the private sector, but the vast majority of innovation actually comes from from the public sector. Yeah, what you can that. say about the private sector is that it is very good at um, incremental improvements. So once you've had that done that basic research, once you've done that basic uh, sort of innovation, um, um, the market is very very good at those incremental um, improvements over time. Public sector, any sort of socialist or, um, or a progressive that favor leads much more towards the public sector has to be able to come up with a, a theory of how it is that the public sector can replicate that really impressive, innovative uh, success um, of, of, of markets. But that's, that's a whole other question. Um, I mean, I think it can, I absolutely think it can be done, but, um, but it's, it is another question. Um, Returning to this, this, I think one of the, the question here around infinite growth on a finite planet I means it, it's so sexy a line, it's so poetic, it seems, I mean, it's, you know, infinite, finite, it's, you know, it really could be in a poem, but it's, you just think about it very quickly and it, and it falls apart. Um, uh, even in a capitalist society, uh, even amongst market actors, um, 
uh, if there are efficiencies that can be done where it takes um, uh, two ingots of steel to produce a widget, uh, uh, two ingots of steel to produce a widget instead of four ingots of steel uh, to produce a widget, they'll, and they'll do it. Um, so that's what's called relative decoupling. Um, and this, what absolute so relative so you can still have an overall expansion of the of material or energetic inputs um even if you have relative decoupling because um you are still even if you are using fewer ingots of steel per widget you're still producing more widgets overall so what you want um, in order to um, um, uh, properly uh, reduce or eliminate your your environmental impact is what's what's called not relative decoupling but absolute decoupling and for many years, degrowthers, and, and still today, many degrowthers claim that there's no such thing as absolute. They recognize that relative decoupling ha is, happens, but there's no such thing as, as absolute decoupling. Well, the evidence is, is, is clear that on uh, sector after sector, there's been uh, lots and lots of absolute decoupling, whether we're talking about fertilizer use in the United States, uh, corn production versus land, land use, potatoes, um, it is um, it, sector after sector in agriculture and industry, there has been absolute decoupling. Is absolute decoupling, um, um, has it gone far enough? No. Is it happening fast enough? No. And one of the reasons it isn't happening fast enough, I, I would argue, is because we have depended far too much on market uh, mechanisms instead of economic planning uh, to steer the ship. Or rather, that there is no steering of the ship um uh in the the amoral uh, anarchic um processes of, of of markets um uh but if if the critique is that uh, absolute decoupling isn't isn't happening fast enough i agree with you but what on earth makes you think that convincing or not you personally but what on earth makes the degrowthers think that convincing all of the electorates of, of the world and all of the autocracies of the world uh that we need to embrace degrowth that we need to stop all economic growth you think that that process will be faster than speeding up absolute decoupling? I mean, I don't even think that it's it's politically feasible. Never mind um, faster. Uh, but it's even if it is feasible, it certainly it's not going to happen anytime. It's not going to happen faster than than trying to speed up um, absolute decoupling. <coughs> Alec, did you have a question? You, um, you know. You're answering it as I'm about to ask it in some ways, so I don't want to totally interrupt, but maybe I can give you time to drink some some water so to give you a, give you a break. Um, you know, so one of my interests here is trying to figure out exactly what differentiates the degrowthers on the left from folks like yourself, um, because ostensibly we we would all well, I mean, there's debates to be had here, but largely we would recognize the value of increased leisure time. Right. So, I mean, there's there's a movement towards a four day work week all over the world. We, we largely recognize that there's a value in the reduction of planned obsolescence. Um, you know, we would we would like to move away from, or, you know, or, or um, sort of reject a more consumer based society where we have sort of endless SUVs and televisions and so on and so forth. At least, you know, maybe maybe you, you disagree there, but at least in, in terms of, you know, the sort of negative mental and physical health consequences of consumerism. Um, you know, uh, positional goods, so on and so forth, right? So, I mean, there's, I think there are good benefits there. And I assume those are part of the degrowth conversation. And so what I'm wondering is, is what really separates the degrowthers on the left from other folks like yourself is really a belief in um, this decoupling question. Is the, is the main difference simply that the degrowthers believe that it is not going to be possible given the pending, you know, impending ecological consequences, it is not going to be possible for us to decouple uh, in terms of absolute decoupling in a way that's going to save our planet. I mean, is that, is that the fundamental difference? Because I, I'm trying to get out exactly what I think this is. And I, I wonder if that's the question. And if that's the case, maybe you want to say a little bit more about why you think that is possible. The, the potential for absolute decoupling is possible. So um all right lots of uh questions uh things to respond to um and yeah we do need to, uh, to talk about leisure time and care work and, and so because this is the future of work so it isn't just about uh, degrowth but um uh, so i'll get to that in a second um first of all um yeah sure um no problems with the critique of planned obsolescence that is 
absolutely a um, an artifact of, of market um, uh, market production. Um, it is uh, irrational with respect to um, uh, material and energetic energetic inputs. Uh, it is environmentally destructive. Uh, it is harmful to households who have to expend more than they otherwise would. Uh, the only uh, people who the only people who benefit are the uh, the shareholders. But then also, <clears throat> ultimately, because of the wider um, societal um, problems that this, this causes, ultimately they also uh, suffer from that too. So it's it's irrational, no matter how you, how you how you look at it. Problem is that planned obsolescence, <clears throat> with respect to uh, it's mainly within consumer facing items. Um, doesn't work as well within um, industrial um, items. Um, the reason, sorry, the problem with this, uh, the critique is not so much that um, they're wrong about the fact that, I agree that we, like a, a, a more rational world, would not have planned obsolescence. The thing is, it's just, it's basically a rounding error in terms of its environmental impact compared to the beating heart of the cause of, of climate change is um, vitally socially necessary production. Heating our houses, building houses, cement production, um, transportation, um, um, uh, uh, food production, um, electricity uh, for all of our, uh, for most of our needs. Mo the vast majority of it is absolutely socially necessary and would still be, uh, in a, uh, be uh, produced in a, in a socialist world. If anything, as I said earlier, there'd be a lot more of it because um, the, the entire world would be benefiting from industrial modernity instead of just the, the, the global north. So what we, we have no choice but to absolutely decouple that. Um, the, sure, okay, let's, let's institute some laws to, to ban planned obsolescence. Like, you know, the European Union is introducing some of these laws. Okay, fine, whatever. It's, it's a rounding error. It's a rounding error. Um, um, in terms of the, the earlier question, I'll, I'll get to the, the questions around leisure time. Oh, one month, whether, and this relates to um, uh, consumerism and consumer items, SUVs and TV, flat screen TVs and stuff like that. Um, I, I don't want to suggest you, Alec, are, have this sort of middle class snobbery in your question. I think it's a good question. But I do think a lot of the people who talk about this do tend to have a sort of I mean, I, okay, so a great example. Um, so Damon Albarn, the lead singer of Blur and Gorillaz, great band from the, from the 90s and the early 2000s. I love the guy, but uh, the music is fantastic. A lot of his lyrics, he's anti-consumerist. He says, you know, we can you know, consume too much. We have these, you know, flat screen TVs and it's just, so we don't need all that. What we need is like, I have this, 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 my second home is in Iceland and I just, I go there and I like decompress and I, know step back from all the consumerism you have a fucking second home in Iceland so there's a you know um the people who um like why 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 do why do we need Barbie dolls when you can just go down to your local farmer's market and have a like a hand carved wooden train that your kid never plays with even though it looks lovely on the shelf um in fact, if anything, the, the energetic material inputs, because it's basically artisanally produced, are probably a lot greater per unit than that Barbie doll that you got, from, or whatever it happens to be from your McDonald's Happy Meal. I mean, one, it's just, there's no attention paid to the actual real industrial processes. Secondly- Cloth diapers. Cloth, cloth diapers. diapers. Yes, absolutely, cloth diapers. The obsession with cloth diapers. Um, one is just it's 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 based on a foundation of sort of magical uh, pastoralist thinking rather than serious understanding of industrial processes and what we actually need to do to do in terms of reduce our environmental impact. And secondly, there's this there's a very middle class there's this middle class snobbery. But at the same time, don't get me wrong. I love going to my uh, farmer's market. I think it's, it's great. It's a it's a fun cultural time. It's a lot it's a lot more fun than the um, than going to the supermarket. At the same time, I recognize that realistically, in terms of its uh, energetic and material inputs per unit of production, it is ridiculously um, extravagant compared to the marvel that is my local Safeway or um, uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, um, what else was it? Oh, finally, yeah, um, on, on the question of SUVs and TVs. Sure, maybe in a social society, we're not gonna be uh, having as much of a priority in, in some of these things as we are in other sort of 
uh, why are we spending so much um, of our production on building of uh, manufacturing of uh, flat screen TVs and improving those flat screen TVs instead of helping uh, develop industrial modernity in, uh, in, in Africa and, and Asia and the rest of the, the global south. Sure, 100% agree with that. But this, this is a complete um, misdirection. Uh, it's, it's a bad set of priorities and it's led by mar a market incentive rather than human rationality and, 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 and human liberation. At the same time, what we've got to remember is that we don't just want bread, but we want roses too. Um, and that uh, we can't forget that one of the great internal critiques of the Soviet Union by the Soviet people of their leadership was that where were the jeans? Where were the where were the uh, the, the washers and dryers? Where were the, the the fun things that they saw on television that they, they that America had, that Britain had, that West Germany had? Um, uh, we have to be able to have consumer items are not only um, um, an excess, not only uh, 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 trinkets and, and, and fripperies, they're fun stuff as well. Um, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a gamer, but a lot of my friends are, and I don't begrudge them their Xboxes. They're under socialism, there would be an Xbox too. I mean, it would be the people's Xbox, but you know, um, we want bread, but we want roses too. Um, and again, uh, another thing, even, even if we are um, reducing the, or making a sort of different set of priorities, again, consumer items are such a small part of the overall problem compared to heat production, cement, um, it's, uh, the, the rest of the stuff that I was talking about. Um, da, 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 states um, acting as companies. This was a great question earlier. You know, Norway is a really great example of this. Um, when I talk about, um, uh, separate uh, uh, decoupling from um, from market mechanisms, or rather, with the, the socialist critique of, of markets is not limited. We are not critiquing um, uh, a family-owned firm or a set of bosses or a set of shareholders. We are saying it's the market. The market itself is the problem. It doesn't matter who owns the, the firm. That firm can be owned by uh, by the workers themselves and the workers' co-op. The, the, uh, the, their interaction with other, and I support um, workers' co-ops. I think it's, we should have more of them, absolutely. Um, but they will still be driven to produce whatever is profitable in a, in, in a market. <clears throat> um, and basically what you have with, with Norway is you have a, a whole um, country that is a that is basically a workers' co-op, if you will, with respect to oil and gas production. Um, they have, uh, that is, that 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 commodity that 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 good is still so bought and sold in markets. So in effect, Norway is a market remains a market actor, which is distinct from Norway as a provider of uh, of health services. Health services in Norway, just as health services in Canada, are almost entirely decommodified. We don't sell them on the market; we just give them. It's just a service. So that's what I'm talking about um, in terms of decommodification. It has to be thoroughgoing. It isn't a change from just like shareholders to the state, it is you have to decommodify the sector. Um, uh, the, the, the question earlier on about uh, Herman Daly and, and Club of Rome, and if you solve these problems, you just come up with more problems, you hit a wall. That was the line, you hit a wall. There is no world without problems. Once we solve some one problem with a set of um, technological or social solutions, there will be new problems that we didn't mean to happen as a result of solving those problems. So we solve those problems. And as a result of solving those problems, there will be new unexpected, unintended uh, consequences as a result of those. And so we solve those problems. It's never going to stop. There is no world. I, mean, I think, I mean, I'm certainly a socialist, but um, I, if I had the critique of, of the, one of the greatest critiques I have of, of, of this, of the, the school of thinking that I come from is the idea of a utopia where all social problems are solved. That we no, no, no. What so all that socialism promises is that there will be less problems than there otherwise um, uh, than otherwise are happening. Than otherwise need to be um, um, uh, under 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 capitalism. It isn't a promise of uh, of Shangri La of utopia of um, an end to all problems. In fact, it's 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 a it's an impossibility. There cannot be a world without problems. So, I think that was the thing I've answered all of those questions.
questions now. Oh, and democracy doesn't work. <laughs> um, um, I mean, if you think that de uh, democracies are not embracing the solutions you would prefer, this happens all the time with me. No democracy has, has ever voted for the, the, the kind of socialism that I uh, would prefer yet. Some policies I, I like, some other ones I disagree with. So what do I do? I work harder to convince people. I knock on doors, I write articles, I work in a democracy to convince the majority to agree with me. Um, <clears throat> if you are, the, the very minute that you, that you think that you, you need to step outside democracy because you are better, you have a better set of ideas than the voters come up with, well, that's, that's, that's Putin, that's Xi, Xi Jinping, that is, that is the barons, the bishops, it is, <clears throat> sorry, I think I sent him away. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's anti-democratic. Um, and I'm afraid, um, I, I mean, I, one of my worries around uh, Extinction Rebellion in the UK, one of the arguments that they make is that democracy isn't working um, because the set of proposals that they would prefer society and uh, the British society and uh, British Parliament embracing um, aren't being implemented. Okay, work harder, convince uh, people. If uh, no, uh, certainly, you're, maybe your your civil disobedience is part of that process. Fine, sure, that's that's fine. But that, there's another thing that they argue that instead of Parliament making decisions about climate change, what there should be is a citizens' assembly, and that citizens uh, citizens' assemblies are fine. I think there's some interesting experience of that with sortition uh, or other other forms of sortition. Um, but here's the, the sort of worrying part about this is that um, the randomly selected people in that citizens assembly would be advised by people who already agree with Extinction Rebellion's demands. And so all that you're doing is you're moving um, the, 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 the locus of power to those, those unelected advisors, the bureaucrats. Um, it, uh, from, you, you may be right that there is, and I, I certainly agree that there is a regulatory capture by um, fossil fuel corporations. That's, that's, that's unquestionable. But you're just, all that you're doing with your, this, that citizens assembly there is moving one set of undemocratic, uh, one undemocratic locus of power to another undemocratic locus of power. We have no choice if we are Democrats and we disagree with um, the policies that are being implemented to just work harder to convince uh, people. So, uh, Lee, I think uh, we have reached the 2.30 uh, mark. Oh, right. And we haven't still haven't got to leisure time and... and or uh, the future of work. work. Yes, uh, we're going to have to have you back for part two at some point. Okay, 30 seconds on that. All for more uh, leisure time. I think that's great. Again, uh, it, it's not really... It's not, really, not going to solve the fundamental problem. If you're having less um, uh, carbon intensive production, you still have some carbon uh, intensive production. Um, we need to have zero carbon intensive production, not less of it. Um, uh, very quickly on the issue of care work, people are now going to be like, there's going to be more like hospitals and, and that's great. I, that's a lovely, wonderful idea. But if you think that hospitals exist without extraction, um, without mining, um, where are the, 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 yeah, the ventilators and diastasis machines, what, what, what are the inputs? Where do they come from? You don't knit them out of, of, of hemp. They are, it, it's, 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 it's minerals uh, dug out of the ground. It's petrochemicals. Um, our, our, the, the challenge before us is not um, uh, to, to eliminate ex extraction or mining, but to make it sustainable. Um, da, 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 on that, yeah. And if we're going to be expect, okay, yeah, so a massive expansion in care work around the world with uh, with healthcare, so there's going to be a lot more hospitals, public hospitals around the world. Again, you're actually going to be increasing the amount of extraction, not decreasing it. There, done. Solve the problem of uh, future work and uh, and. Thank we're, you so our much. Next talk, our next talk, by the way, is uh, should we plug into the metaverse, which also has future work implications? December sixth at one p.m. and you can. Uh, uh, check. You can register for that um, through our newsletter and uh, the IET Twitter page and also Facebook. Thank you so much, Lee. That was really fun. <clears throat> and yes, there are lots of topics that we left on the table. So we'll have to come back to this at some point. No worries. <laughs>